Amen. You can't be seated. The Lamb definitely is worthy. Amen. Of our praise. There's no doubt about it. He's... I can't be the only one that uh, has been struggling over the last, you know, week. At least. But uh, nonetheless, He is still worthy. Yeah. Yeah. He's been good to us. Sometimes we don't want to see it that way. But God has been good to us. Mm -hmm. And I thank Him for that. I don't intend to keep you long this morning. And I have preached this before, I, I, I'm pretty sure. But for some reason, it was just as, as clear as day that this is what I need to talk to you about this morning. And uh, again, I can't be the only one who's had issues um, of, any, of any kind. There's one thing that I've realized, me and Dan talked about it first thing this morning when he, when he came in. There's one thing I realized is we all have our problems. We all have our struggles. You know, what may be a struggle to you may not be a struggle to me. And what may be a struggle to me may not be a struggle to you. But you know, that's the enemy's plan. You know that, right? You know, and don't, don't get me wrong. Now, I believe that there's a lot of stuff that God gives us too to strengthen our faith and to strengthen our trust in Him. But I do believe that the enemy knows what our weaknesses are, even if the test is coming from God. And that's probably the first thing that you're going to be tried with. Especially if you receive a blessing from the Lord, expect the enemy to pop his head up. It's just the way it is. And it's, it hasn't changed. It's always been that way. But I get tired sometimes. And I know y'all do too. You get, and I mean spiritually tired. And you need some rest. And that's what I'm going to talk to you briefly about this morning. Is in Matthew chapter number 11 and verse 28. It's only one verse of scripture. And I, that's all I'm going to need this morning. Is just this one verse of scripture. I just want to talk to you briefly about how we can get spiritual rest in a time to where it seems like we can't slow down. In the world. Or in the things of God. We just sometimes we just can't seem to slow down. So I'm going to talk to you briefly about that this morning. In Matthew chapter number 11 and verse 28. The Bible says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. And like I said, that's all I need. And you're like, you can get something out of that one scripture? Yeah, I sure can. Um, because uh, I got a whole lot out of John 3.16. Where he said that whosoever, I was one of those whosoever's at one time. And every day uh, I'm tested to wonder if I'm still a whosoever. <laughs> so, but uh, God is, is, has a way of, of, of helping us get this rest. And the first thing in rest that we come to is the R. And you have to respond correctly to what's going on in your life. You know, and I say that because um, not everything that's bad comes from the devil. It just doesn't. And we give him just a little bit too much credit. I mean, if you read the Bible, you realize that he doesn't even have the keys to his own house. But yet we give him credit for ruining our lives. You know, you have a flat tire. The devil jumped all over me. Did he or did God stop you from a wreck? Or did you just have a flat tire? Things happen, you know. Um, so not, not everything that happens, uh, what we say is, is bad in our life, comes from the devil. But I'm also telling you that you have to have spiritual discernment to be able to, to figure out, is it the enemy? Is it God? Is it a test? Is it just life? Because you don't want to sit here and take something nonchalantly if it really is a small enemy attack, no doubt. But you also don't want to talk to God about giving credit to his enemy when God is the one that allowed it to happen to start with. So we have to respond correctly to what we're going through. You know, and the people that need rest are those who are laboring. The ones who are putting the gospel out there. The ones who are teaching people. The ones who are living daily. You, you may not even open your mouth, but you don't know that you're teaching people if you're living by the ways of the Lord. Yeah. They watch you. You better believe it. If you ever posted something about Christians, something about God, something about church, oh, buddy, they're going to watch you. And that's okay. I mean, that's, hey, I want them to. But I also want to be able to live a life that's acceptable to the Lord and I don't become a stumbling block for those people, right? 
So we have to respond correctly. And the other people are those that are heavy laden. If you if you research this, I pulled up into Strong's Concordance. That was showing like spiritual anxiety, like burdens and, and spiritual anxiety. I mean, I, I'm not the only one that has that. You, you get into a situation sometimes you're just like, God, where are you? Yeah. Where are you? What, what did I do wrong? Mm -hmm. The enemy loves to tell you that. That when a test comes your way, you did something wrong. Yeah. Right? Now, Mary and Martha found themselves in, in that situation when their brother passed away. They sent word to Jesus. He had plenty of time to do it. He could have snapped his fingers and not even been there. And he would have been made home. And the damsel, he told him, he said, go on home to be healed. Right? But he waited four days to show up. And they had to respond correctly. Jesus never said he died. He said he was asleep. And then when he tells him to come forth, I love that part where he says, take you away the stone. Jesus told them to take away the stone because he didn't tell them to put it there to start with. And then he calls him by name. He says, Lazarus, come forth. <coughs> and why did he say that? Because that if not, everybody that was asleep at that time or dead would have came forth. Not to mention everybody there probably would have had a heart attack and not been able to take that kind of power of the Lord. But not everything that we go through is from the devil. You think about Peter walking on the water. I've heard a lot of preachers and stuff in the past and even myself have said that um, when Peter stepped out of the boat and went to Jesus, first of all, did you know that Jesus put them in that position? The Bible says in Matthew 14 and 22, I think it is, that Jesus constrained them in the boat. In other words, he made him get in the boat. He knew what was about to happen. Y'all just sat right here and watched all these miracles and teachings and preachings and everything else. I'm fixing to see just how much you do love him. Get in that boat, take off, watch what's going to happen. So they see him, and, and, and the Bible says that they intended that he, had, he would have passed them by. One of the synoptic gospels says that he would have passed them by, but he didn't because they cried out immediately. But the Bible says that they cried out over fear. They cried out out of fear. So their fear overcame their faith for just a brief moment. But if you read that story, it says that immediately Jesus intervened. He didn't have to wait. He didn't have to think about it. So to me, that tells me that whether we cry out to him out of despair or stress or fear or even out of faith, he's going to listen to his children. That doesn't mean it's going to happen exactly like we want it to at that very moment. But I was listening to something back in uh, January of 2018. I was at another church. And I was, I was listening to that. And, and in the beginning of it, I told them that somebody had been, and I don't even remember who it is. Lord, forgive me. Maybe he'll reveal that to me another time. Somebody had told me way back then that there was an anointing that was coming that was going to be on me that people were going to know who I was. They were going to know, and, and I don't want that. I just want you to know that God is working. That's it. If you never remember my name, just know that big old joker that God worked through it. That's it. That's all you need to know. Amen. You fast forward two years later, that's when that video came out about depends on whose hands it's in. Some of y'all don't know all the stories that have happened with that. It's been viewed like 50 million times all across the entire globe. I still have people that talk to me from Brazil that were touched by that. I had a, a, an army veteran who was about to commit suicide who found the video online and he messaged me and told me that because of the video and what God did in his heart that he decided not to kill himself. So I, you know, but again, it's not me, but what it was, I didn't put that together until last night. I was like, wow, it, it took two years, but it, it come to pass. The, the word of the Lord went out to 50 million people. And now the Collinsworth family's got that song and they're on their tour and they're still playing it all across the country because they play that video right before they do the song that they wrote. So it happens, just not in our time. We, I, I didn't, not necessarily I didn't believe it at the time. I'm just saying I didn't want to believe it because that's not who I am. I don't want to be on, t on television and that's, that's not who I am, right? But I want to do what the Lord says to do. So Peter was walking on the water, and you can remember that some of the preachers growing up, um, when he began to sing, they said, oh, he didn't have any faith, and da 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 And Jesus did tell him, oh, you have a little faith, right? But I don't believe that's what he meant. This is the problem that most of us have, including myself. Peter had faith. If Peter didn't have any faith, he wouldn't have got out of the boat. Yeah. That's the first thing. 
But you know, we're living in a time where a lot of people won't even get in the boat and get in the water, much less step out of the boat when they're in the water. So Peter had some faith, no doubt. So it wasn't that he had none. It wasn't the depth of it or any of that kind of stuff. It was his endurance. He began to focus on the things that were around him and his situation more than he did God. So he began to sink. So that's the second part of rest. The E in rest is for endurance. We've got to have endurance to endure what we're doing and what God is giving us and what the enemy's throwing at us and what God is protecting us from. We've got to have endurance. And, and what I like about this part with Jesus was he didn't hold Peter's head, head underneath the water when he sank and said, I'm fixing to teach you a lesson. And snapped his fingers at the ones that were left in the boat and says, hey, are y'all watching this right here? Let me teach you a lesson real quick about not having faith in me. He didn't do that. Peter cried out when he began to sink. And the Bible says that immediately Jesus saved him. Jesus reached down and grabbed him, right? But if you read a little bit further, it says that the storm didn't cease until they got back into the boat. So to me, that tells me that that's a perfect picture of Jesus walking through our storms with us, holding our hand, walking through the storm, with, even when we fail. Yeah. Even when we fail. Peter failed in that moment, if that's how you want to say it, right? But Jesus held his hand and walked back to the boat with him, and then the storm was calm. Jesus is walking with us in our storms, even after we fail him. So we need that endurance. And, and, and if you look at the story in the book of Mark, Peter's name is not mentioned. It just says that Jesus walked on water. They never mentioned a disciple. Well, Mark wasn't there. Mark got his information that he pinned from Peter. So for me, I'm thinking 40 years later, Peter realizes that it's not about me anymore. It's all about Jesus. If I'm telling you a story about something that happened in the past, and that's my opportunity to shine and say, hey, I walked on the water with Jesus. But I don't do it, which is what Peter didn't do, because it wasn't about Peter. It was about what God did or what Jesus did with Peter. So that's why Mark is not even mentioned, because Peter didn't mention it. He wasn't trying to be boastful. So, but back to the endurance. We've got to have faith and endurance. Because 2 Timothy 4 and 5 says to endure our inflictions. We have to endure them. That means that they're coming, so we have to endure them. And then James, in the book of James, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, or I'm sorry, verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised him to him that loved him. That's what it's all about, is enduring all these temptations. So when the time comes and we're tried, that crown of life that's been laid up for us is there. That's what it's all about. So we've got to have this endurance as well, just like Peter needed that endurance. And the Bible says in uh, Hebrews 10 to 36, it says that we have a need of patience. The New King James Version says endurance. So we, we have a need of this. It's nothing that's new. And then Mark says that uh, blessed is he that endured to the end that the same shall be saved. That's what Mark 13, 13 says. So endurance is in the Bible. It's all in the Bible. We need this endurance. That's Mark 13, 13. And then in Hebrews chapter number 12, still talking about endurance, the very first verse says that seeing that we are encompassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which does beset us. Let us run the race with patience, endurance, the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith, who the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Hey, Jesus had to have some endurance too. You got to have endurance to be able to get through this stuff. You're going to get punched in the face. Turn the other side. Hit me on the other side. Take a couple body shots. That's our endurance. Now, the writer here wants you to see that this is, this is like a, we're encompassed about such a great cloud of witnesses. It, we're not in a coliseum with like 80 or 90,000 people with cheerleaders and all this and that kind of cheer on. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is all the people he talked about in chapter number 11. 
The faith chapter is what many people know it as. When you talk about Moses and Enoch and Abraham and Abel and how he offered a better sacrifice than Cain, that's the cloud of witnesses that he's talking about. That's where you and I study the Word of God to find out what he did in their life. And then when you find out what he did in their life, you realize that his promises are still true today. See, Abraham didn't change being old. The promise still came true. Yeah. David uh, committed adultery, but the promise still came true. Then Joseph uh, was a dreamer. He spent time in a pit, but the dreams still come true. We can't give up on them. We have to endure the, the things. I don't know. I don't know what it is when, when it looks like you take this church, for instance. Just, I'm just using this as a short illustration. You take this church as uh, for instance, and, and we feel like that the core, the trunk, the, the trunk that keeps coming back day after day after day, there's your fire, right? And then you got these little branches that come out, and then before you know it, the seats are filled up, and there's a little bit of almost looks like kudzu, right? It's, it's kind of thick in here. Well, the Word of God is still being preached. Why? Because the trunk is still living. The trunk is still standing. But God is pruning out what doesn't need to be here. Yeah. That, that hurts and that doesn't feel very well sometimes, especially when some of them are some of our closest friends and some of our relatives and stuff like that. But it's not our church. We've got to have the endurance to still stand that if it's only 10 people, we've got to still stand and trust that the trunk is here. And those that grow from the trunk, from the inside out, that God plants onto the trunk are the ones that will be here regardless. Yeah. But there's a time for pruning. If you don't prune a tree, guess what? It's going to choke out and it's going to die. They prune a tree so it can, it, it can have healthy trunk and, and smaller branches. So it's got to be done. It, it doesn't make me feel any better, Ms. Don. It really doesn't. Because one of the songs that we were doing, I couldn't help but look around the church and the people that are not here. Um, some of them may be sick. That's okay. I'm not, I don't mean like that. I'm just saying the people that are not here that are still part of the trunk, I see them sitting in these seats. Y'all know how we are. We typically try to sit in the same spot every time, right? I see them sitting in their seats. But they're not here today. Some of them have been pruned out. That's not for me to decide. All I, all I can do is continue to, to preach and have the endurance. Amen. Amen. And then when God says whatever, then who am I to argue with God? I can't argue with Him. So we, have, we need this endurance. That's why all these people are mentioned in Hebrews chapter number 11. So you can go back and read and say, oh, the, 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 the harlot Rahab had some faith and endurance and she didn't perish. Why? Because she helped the spies. So you go back and you read the story about Rahab. What did she do? She was a harlot. Wait a minute. Whoa. whoa. Yeah, it's true. God can use a harlot. He can. And if he can use harlot, he can use you. There's nothing that you've done that God can't use you for the kingdom of heaven if you'll allow it to. Amen. But we have to have that endurance. So with the endurance, after you have this endurance, what do you need endurance for? That's the S in rest. We need endurance for the sufferings. And the sufferings are going to come. They're going to come. They just are. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 1 that um, Christ suffered for us. So if he suffered for us, that pretty much tells me that we're going to have to do some suffering for him. Yeah. I, I don't know that we'll ever get to the point, we, we may, to where Christians in America are being persecuted to the point of death. We may. I don't know. Where would your faith be at that moment? Where would your endurance be at that moment? It's hard for me to even fathom and think about that I wouldn't be able to have a Bible and I wouldn't be allowed to come inside of a church building together with people. Much less somebody hold one of my children out in front of me and say that either you denounce God or they're dead. That happens. In other countries. You go a couple thousand miles across the water. And it happens. This is a demonic influence. 
You got that, right? Yeah. You know what happens with the demonic influence? These people travel. These people come over here. They begin to infect more people. And now you have demonic spirits running all about the United States. And it very well could happen to where it could come here. I don't know. All it's going to take is the wrong person getting in the office and then the Supreme Courts and decisions get made. And America's in a downhill spiral when it comes to their relationship with Jesus. It can happen. And it's hard for me to fathom how would I be in that situation. Uh, people call them glory bumps or goose bumps, but just thinking about that makes my skin crawl. And the hair standing up on my arms just thinking about it. Because just like I posted the other day, that's great that you saw God in your last situation. And he delivered you through it. He gave you the answer to your prayer. It was all, it worked out wonderful. And your faith just went up three notches. And that's great. What if it would have went the other way? What if that person that is on their deathbed that you've been praying for, that got healed, right? What if God said, no, now is their time? Where would your faith be then? Where would your endurance be then? See, we, we got to have this endurance. See, because he knows exactly how much it's going to take for us to turn to him, to want to give up, to want to quit. He knows exactly. See, I've got a little step ladder at home. It's only like three steps. And I haven't used it in a long time, but hey, I remember when I used to have to work on things around the house, I'd pull that little step ladder out and I'd unfold it and there'd be this big old sign on it that said weight limit 225. <laughs> and I'd look at it and then I'd remember the scale the last time I stepped on it and I said, Lord, if you'd help me just one more time. <laughs> and I remember as I'd climb the little step ladder, I'd have my feet all the way out to the sides where the rivets were at that went through the, I needed the most support that I could get. And it never broke with me. I never fell off of it. But the point that I'm making is I'm about 75 pounds heavier than what the weight limit is. And if I ever fall off of it, you know what I'll say? I should have trusted the maker. I should have trusted the maker of that ladder because you know why? When they made it, they put weight on it. And they tested it. And they knew what it was going to take to bend and to break and to fall apart and for it to give up. We have got to trust the maker. That's Jesus. Jesus made us. Jesus and God know exactly what our weight limit is. He knows exactly what he can put on William's shoulders and what he can put on Dan's shoulders. He's, he's not done with these things. Why? Because he's the maker. The difference is, is we don't know what that weight limit is. We can't see the label like I could on this ladder. We just have to trust God. It's a label that we can't see. We have to endure. We have to understand that the suffering is going to come. But your sufferings are not always about you. That's a fact. I can prove it by Scripture too. The sufferings and the things that you go through could be for somebody else watching your life and how you handle the situation and how you handle the outcome of that situation. They could be on the fence right now and you'd be going through something that they know about. And if you can just hold on, respond correctly to what's going on, have the endurance to go through it, know that there's some suffering that's coming. And if you can just hold on, that may be exactly what they needed to make the decision to follow Christ. But if you don't, they're likely to say it didn't work for them. So why do I need it? See, the reality of it is that's why people have a hard time sometimes. I'm not going to take much more of your, your time this morning, but some people have a hard time understanding why a seven-year-old child has to die with cancer. It's tough. It is very tough. I find myself wondering sometimes too, God, why did you put that family through that? Why did you even have the child here to start with? God, why did you allow them to go through this and this and this and this? Right? I find myself wondering that. But if we could ever understand that somewhere God is in this, it could be for the family to respond correctly. And thank you, God, for allowing me that little bit of time that I did have with them. 
and to have the endurance to endure that hardship. So somebody else on the outside looking in can say, hey, if God can help them through that, He can help me. So your sufferings aren't always about you. You know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Amen. They, 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 they come down to, to Nebuchadnezzar, and he's over here. Uh, Y'all going to bow down to me? And he's like, no, we ain't either. So here these young kids are. Hey, they're trying to have faith in God. And this king says, okay, well, if you don't know, I'm going to kill you. And they said, all right, kill us. So he has his men turn the furnace up. Basically to the hottest setting. Could you imagine those Hebrew children standing off to the side? I, I would be trembling. I would be. Do you think that they had a, a lump in their throat? Maybe it's hard to swallow. Maybe they looked at each other. Maybe they touched each other on the leg like this and said, you sure we're doing what's right? <laughs> but the fire got turned up not for them. The fire got turned up for the guards that threw them in. The fire wasn't for them. The fire was for the guards. Your sufferings ain't always for you. It could be for your enemies. They threw them into the fire. The men died. The guards died and threw them in. That's how hot it was. Then the king looks over in there and he says, Wait a minute now, didn't we throw three in there? I, I don't recall, Greg, you, you, you can correct me, but I don't recall Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ever saying that God was in the fire with them. I believe that was the king that said that. Didn't they look over and say, hey, there's, there's one, a, a fourth one in there that's likened unto the Son of Man? That's likened to God? The fire and the boys being thrown in there wasn't for them. It was for the king. It's not always about me and you. I look at my sufferings and again, I'm like, God, what are you trying to show me? God, what did I do wrong? God, where are you trying to lead me? This and that. John, it ain't for you, son. God's just saying, know that there's a suffering. Just endure it. That's all I'm asking you to do is endure it. Somebody else could be watching. So it wasn't for the boys. And what I like about it too is what bound them up was burned off in the fire. The fire was for the guards, the enemies got killed, the king got converted, and the worldly things that bound the boys was burned away. And then you look at the children of Israel in the Red Sea. Look at this suffering that we're going through. You brought us out of Egypt to bring us down here so we can die in front of the Red Sea because here comes Pharaoh and the army. They're about to kill us. Look at the suffering we're going through. The suffering's not for you, children of Israel. Just endure. I'm about to make the land dry. And you're going to walk across it. And the enemies that are pursuing you, that's who your suffering is for. The sea isn't for you. It's for them. I'm about to kill them. Hold, hold, hold tight. A lot of people, you know how they say that they hold my beard. You know, it's always like a little funny meme. God's like, hold my holy water. Watch this, you know. <laughs> and he kills the enemies that are pursuing you. So the sufferings aren't always about you and I. It's hard not to think of that sometimes, but it's true. 1 Peter 5 and 10 says, that, But God of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that we have suffered a while, He'll make you perfect, establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. The sufferings are, are, are biblical. It's going to happen. But that's where that endurance comes in. That's where the endurance comes in. So the last thing on here in rest is T. And this was, this was hard. You respond correctly to it the way that God tells you to. You have the endurance. You know that there's sufferings. Now you have to trust Him. That's what the T is. is you have to trust God. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. You know, uh, I've had to deal with this. 
You can't even have a good relationship with your partner without trust. You can't. But you know what I'm coming to find out and coming to learn is the same thing that we come to find out and we come to learn when we read the Bible. We allow past events and past circumstances to determine our trust for tomorrow. Why? Because we look at the bad outcomes. But what about the good outcomes of the people who had that endurance, knew they were suffering, and chose to trust God anyway, and He delivered them, and He set them free, and He brought the promised truth? What about those? What if we could focus on those and have that kind of trust in God? So that's what it needs to have rest. The spiritual rest that you and I need. We've got to trust that God has our best interest at heart. The, I, I can't tell most of y'all anything that you don't already know. Some of y'all have been going to church longer than I've been born. Hey, I did too. I went to church nine months before I was ever born. So, you know that the Bible says that for we know that God causes all things to work together for the good to those that love Him and are called according to His purpose. So rest assured, if you're called according to His purpose and you love Him, everything that happens is for the good. But we have to respond to it correctly. We have to have endurance to endure through it. Understand that the sufferings are there. And to trust God through your circumstances. Amen. 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 Let's all stand. We're going to do one more song. And then we're going to get out of here. I told you I would keep it too long. Did I? I don't know. Love you anyway. I'll be pretty good.